Okay, great, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Beth Boland. I am the chair of the New England chapter of NECD, and we are delighted to have this great group together for a very timely topic of the 2023 proxy season, What Happened? This is the sequel to the highly popular uh, uh, program that we did earlier this year, looking ahead to the proxy season. So we welcome everybody here. We especially welcome our friends from the Philadelphia chapter, and we are so delighted to co-host this program with them. A uh, couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, I hope that everybody is on mute so that we can give the speakers their due as they speak. Second of all, um, for the chat box, ordinarily we ask people to put their questions in the chat box. We probably won't have enough time today to get to those questions, but we do welcome your comments. What we love to have is people commenting on what the speakers are saying as they're saying that in the chat box. So we always have a lively side conversation on that as well. If you'd like credits for attending today's session, then please make sure that your name is on your box. Um, and finally, the panelists and moderators comments and statements are their own and not those of the organizations for which they work. I would be remiss if I did not thank all of the sponsors of the New England and the Philadelphia chapters. We love our sponsors. They really are the lifeblood of what we do here at NACD, and we can't thank them enough. There's one particular sponsor that we would like to thank today, which is BDO. Um, BDO has been a longtime sponsor for our chapter, and we really appreciate their support of our mission of excellent corporate governance. And with that, I will turn that over, turn the program over to my good friend and wonderful moderator, Gloria Larson. Thank you so much, Beth. And I'm excited to join all of you, but I'm especially excited to introduce today's speakers. Paul DiNicola, who is a principal at PwC's Governance Insight Center, and Jesse Lockman, a corporate partner and co-lead of Capital Markets and co-lead of Capital Markets and Public Company Advisory Practice at Foley Lardner. Both of them are frequent speakers at forums on corporate governance matters, and both serve as advisors to public company boards and their executive teams on these and related issues. We couldn't have two better experts with us to turn to this topic, so let's get started. The 2023 proxy season occurred during a time of macroeconomic concerns, market volatility, and potential shifts in ESG views by investors. So perhaps it's not surprising that this season was unique in several meaningful ways. First, in the record volume of shareholder proposals, increased support for say on pay and director nominees, reducing a downward trend from the last couple of years. The first year of required pay versus performance disclosures and perhaps the beginning of anti-ESG sentiment. And while many had predicted the new universal proxy would lead to a groundswell of activist activity. That just didn't happen, making it difficult at this point to fully assess future impact. Today's opportunity, I think, is one to do a deeper dive in what really happened in, in 2023. And we plan this program to coincide with the activities of boards and companies across the country who are very likely already underway in planning for the upcoming 2024 proxy season. As you learn more details about the proxy voting results, evolving investors' viewpoints, and new disclosure requirements that will now include the new cyber rules, we hope this information is going to prove help to you as you continue to think about your company's own um, bespoke governance profile, as well as you consider the best ways to get engaged with investors on these important topics. So let's get this really underway. And our first topic of the three that we're going to cover this morning is the shareholder proposals, the trends from 23 and what we might expect in 24. I'm gonna first turn to you, Paul, and I know you're gonna be using slides. We intend to provide all of your slides and all of the information that you have there um, to our audience in the next couple of days. So the first thing I think you could do is give us a primer on the overall landscape of, about both what shareholder proposals look like this past year and investor behavior as well. 
And if you get the opportunity, um, it would also be great if you could share if you're seeing particular investors targeted for certain types of proposals. Um, so Paul, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sure, uh, good morning, Gloria. And uh, thanks for having Jesse and I uh, this morning. Uh, I, I guess the place to start uh, when you take a look at the, the 23 proxy season uh, is sort of the, the macro environment. And so uh, if you look at the total number of shareholder proposals in uh, 23, there were 580 proposals that were actually put to a, a shareholder vote. And that's a slight uptick overall in volume uh, from last year, but it's actually a 25% increase from uh, two years ago, from 2021. And before the proxy season began, we anticipated pretty high proposal activity, but the ultimate tally, I think, totally exceeded my expectations. There are a couple of factors that I think contributed to the increase in overall shareholder proposals. Uh, the first of which is that there was a pretty significant jump, uh, about 27% jump in the number of proposals related to executive compensation which to me signals a, a really renewed focus on executive pay packages uh, by shareholders. Uh, there was also uh, a increase in the number of both ENS, environmental and uh, social proposals, which of the total accounted for about half, so, so a big number. And then I'd say the, the final driver for the increase in number is the impact of uh, the regulatory environment at the SEC. So the SEC took steps to uh, narrow uh, the ways in which a company can exclude proposals uh, from shareholders in the proxy statements. So the number of no action letters uh, we see, and those by the way are requests from companies to exclude on grounds like uh, duplication or ordinary business, um, those uh, continue to drop. Uh, in terms of the overall support, overall support of shareholder proposals did drop uh, to 23% from 32% last year. And it, just a couple factors that contribute to that. Um, first, you know, I think there was limited shareholder appeal uh, to proposals that were too prescriptive, that really tried to um, define or encroach upon management responsibilities. I think companies did a good job uh, in responding to shareholder concerns. And those actions were seen as addressing the real spirit of the shareholder proposal. And then we'll talk about this a little bit more, but we're operating in an environment of anti-ESG backlash. And I think that influenced voting patterns with some shareholders, um, which resulted in reduced support for environmental and social proposals. Jesse? Well, I think that we will jump in, Gloria, as a next question. Yeah, I like it. I'm just, I'm seeing, I'm still seeing the slide up. Sorry, I didn't see you pop up on the screen. So, um, Jesse, I would love it if we really could now do that deeper dive um, that Paul's alluding to. So great, um, once over, Paul, on what this looked at from um, 5,000 feet. And now I'd love it if we could turn to the e &S mm -hmm. side, because you already have given a little bit of background on what may mm -hmm. have happened there. But it's pretty startling to see that continuous um, surge of e &S proposals and then see such a precipitous drop. And I'm wondering if um, it's a pretty increasingly complex landscape, and you've alluded to some reasons, Paul, but I wonder, Jesse, if you could go into even more detail in what you think the takeaways are, starting with the environmental proposals, because there's an awful lot of sort of a set of crowded reasons why this may have all collided um, to have just uh, sort of pushed that support uh, down much lower. And I'm wondering if you could comment as part of it on one of the things that Paul said, and I think this may apply in social too, that there's some um, um, level of um, pulling back on the part of investors. They support these ideas, but at the same time, um, there's a bit of a chill right now. And I'm wondering if that's not particularly um, impactful and, and maybe all more so in 24. So you can allude to 24 as well. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone for allowing me to, to be here to present as well today. So Paul set the stage very nicely, as did Gloria. And I want to do one more piece of stage setting here, which is um, to answer a question someone asked me, which is, what is proxy season? 
I mean, maybe starting from the base, like what is the proxy season for most companies? And I think from my corporate governance legal perspective, proxy season is all year. And I suspect many of you feel that same way um, through your board service or otherwise, that for calendar year companies, that the proxy season, the solicitation period, you know, be, kicks off in the spring and, and ends with a meeting in May or June. But the preparation for that proxy statement, certainly the pen to paper, the, the fingers to keyboard starts much earlier than that. And where we are now is, you know, even earlier than that. And it really is the evaluation of what should your proxy statement look like uh, in the next coming years? What other proposals might you be considering to include in your proxy statement? Who might your director nominees be? And as you'll hear through this entire session, what level of engagement should you as a company, as a management team, as a board be having with your investors to help you prepare for what's to come? So I think proxy season is year round and we're in now for calendar year companies that period of preparation. So just sort of right sizing when we're talking about proxy season. And Gloria, you asked questions about environmental initiatives in particular. So, um, Fewer than 5% of the environmental shareholder proposals, again, those proposals that individual shareholders or institutions can seek to put on the company's ballot and seek to include in the proxy materials, fewer than 5% of those received majority support. And that number is a way down from 21 and from 22. So now the question is, there were increased proposals, but why less support? And I think a number of factors come into play. Paul mentioned the proposals being more prescriptive. What does that mean? They're more specific to what a shareholder proponent thought a management team or a company should do. Less conceptual, more, you should prepare a report in this manner. You should take action in this manner. Investors seem to be less likely to support that very pres prescriptive um, set of uh, acts presumably leaving in the discretion of the board and the management team um, the best way for, for those companies to handle based on their industry, based on their individual situations, those climate change, those environmental related issues. In fact, BlackRock came out with its post-season, post-proxy meeting season report and said something just to that effect, um, looking to the management teams and the boards to be able to execute on these important initiatives in their own way. So too prescriptive. Um, whether the proposal, if implemented, would be too costly. And I think that's uh, part of what you alluded to here, Gloria and Paul will talk about anti ESG. At what point is the investment that companies are being asked to make in some of these initiatives, at what point is it too much? Is it too much in terms of management attention and diversion? Is it too much in terms of cost? How does the proposal or the initiative fit with really the long-term strategy of the business? And I think investors are reacting now with more thoughtful um, consideration of, does this make sense for this business? or this industry. I think management teams have also been addressing underlying concerns more proactively. We've seen a lot more sustainability reporting. We've seen a lot more social and uh, environmental initiatives being publicly announced, disclosed, um, put into much depth in the proxy statement or other filings. I think there is less ability for a shareholder proponent to say, hey, company, you haven't done this yet. There's a lot more for a management team to point to, to say, well, why in fact that we have. And I also think the pendency of these SEC rules are all waited, um, with, waiting with bated breath here for the new SEC climate disclosure rules. I think the fact that we don't know what those will look like and that there's so much politicization of, of what those might be has investor groups and others in a wait and see approach. Let's see what the SEC says. Let's see how the management teams and boards react. So I would say from a prediction standpoint, we likely will see more proposals following the adoption of those SEC rules as companies begin to comply in their own ways. Jesse, do you have a crystal ball uh, guesstimate about is the issuance of those rules? No, I'd say if I, I wish I did, but um, the SEC <laughs> still has the rules on its uh, agenda for October 2023, and we're getting very close to October 2023. And so I think that there's, um, and one side, there's a lot of hope those rules are issued then, and I think there's plenty of um, hope that they're not, right? But uh, at this point, I still think that we're telling our clients that they should anticipate a, a fall rules. That said, when those rules will then be effective in terms of implementation or disclosure and you know uh, upcoming 
doing 10K or other filings, that would be a longer period of time following the, the finalization of the rules. Well, more to follow. Thank you, Jesse. So, Paul, back to you. Um, I want to go back to the anti-ESG proposal submissions because they did increase significantly, but off a very low base to start with. So uh, the voting tallies were exceptionally low. But again, what do you think this signals both now? What are the trends coming out of this and potentially for 24 too, particularly as we go into a presidential election year where um, companies may find themselves uh, with dueling proposals, one pro action on, e and, on the E and, and S side and, and against. So if you could talk a little bit about the trend lines we saw coming out of 23 and then fast forward to 24, if you've got some predictions. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, and I actually have some some data on this on on the next slide as well. Um, the uh, you know the 2023 season as it related to to ESG proposals was 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 kind of schizophrenic, and and we saw really a a, a move from you know ESG being a you know a three letter acronym to it being ultimately a four word, four letter expletive, right? In in some in some fashions, right? Um, the, the total number of e ENS proposals that made it to a vote, uh, as you mentioned, Gloria, continue to rise. Um, and that's sort of reversing a trend uh, that was pretty flat during uh, the pandemic years. Um, and, you know, really one of the biggest drivers uh, in that increase in volume was the emergence of, you know, what we've talked about as anti-ESG proposals. Um, and those proposals essentially encourage companies to rescind or to pull back on certain ESG initiatives that they are either considering or that they already have in place. And so if you look at the Russell 3000 um, as, a, as a total, um, they have 89 of these kinds of proposals. That's up from 54 last year. But only 41 actually made it to a vote. If you look at the support for those proposals, average support was six percent, and only and in fact none of those shareholder proposals uh, passed with a with a majority majority support. So what were the what were the proposals on? Um, you had some that had called for uh, greater disclosure of diversity, equity, and inclusion information. You also had uh, proposals on racial and civil rights audits. Um, you know, but support for the more traditional proposals uh, fell as well. I think overall, shareholders were more reserved when they were, you know, casting their votes this year. Um, just eight of the total of 316 environmental and social proposals received majority support. And across the board, across all the proposals, it was pretty difficult to find significant pockets of support. I'd say for the board members on our webcast today, a, a really important sign here is that, you know, your your gut or your intuition may say to interpret these results as some kind of indication that shareholders have pulled back from their ESG risk, um, but uh, their focus on ESG risk. But I can tell you from discussions with stewardship groups that uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it refers more back to you know, what Jesse had talked about around the types of proposals we saw and the level of prescription uh, in those proposals. What's behind the, the decline? Um, I think companies can take some credit here that the information that they are providing in disclosures uh, to shareholders and other stakeholders has really evolved to be more responsive and focusing on issues um, uh, really in preparation for um, the mandated disclosure that we're looking at for cybersecurity and climate and ultimately for human capital. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit about shareholder engagement, but uh, in our annual corporate director survey at, at PwC, um, we find that you know, a growing number of board members are engaging directly uh, with shareholders and are rating the quality of those shareholder engagements uh, as better. So I think shareholder engagement uh, has improved. And I think both of those factors uh, may have led to shareholder proposals being withdrawn um, or shareholders declined to, to vote for those proposals because uh, they think through the disclosure and through the engagement, they get a sense that 
companies are already complying with the spirit of the shareholder proposal. And I think in the final analysis, investors appear to be a little bit more cautious um, uh, and are looking more for that direct link between environmental and social topics uh, of the proposals and any sense of perceived unmitigated risk, uh, material, material risk to a company. One final thing here, you know, investors have, are also responding to criticism of their own investing programs by being more transparent around which proposals they in fact support. Thank you, Paul. Those were really excellent points. And I wonder um, if I could just do a real quick follow up. It also seems to me from my own public company experience that companies for some time, particularly S&P 500 companies have been really um, tying to both their E and their S activities are tied very directly to their core strategy, um, to their business imperatives. And I think that's your best offense and defense um, against uh, these anti-proposals when in fact you're showing firsthand your homework around whether it's your climate change activities, both those that protect you and those that uh, uh, from your own activities could result in risk and harm, as well as things like um, DEI, where your goals are well stated, it's part and parcel of your company valuation, mm -hmm. both the ENS and what how you intend to ensure long-term um, valuation for the company, as well as sustainability. And, what, what do you think about that? That there are just more companies that are so well equipped to say, no, this is part of doing business for us. Yeah, yeah, no, no, a, a, absolutely. Um, but I do, you know, I do sense within the environment that there is, there continues to be skepticism on the part of board members around the link between ESG initiatives, let's say more broadly, and financial performance, right? So, um, and I, I'd say, you know, if you one of the things you might want to walk away from from our uh, webcast this morning with is asking yourself that question, right? Do you see a clear link to the strategy, and what is your view on the link between ESG and financial performance? In our annual corporate director survey, forty percent of board members say they don't see that link, right? So there is still a there is still a skepticism between, you know, what the company is doing around ESG and how that trickles down to the bottom line. Well, that's a really interesting point because that also ties to shareholder views, um, which may not be in lockstep with other stakeholder views, which would be more encouraging around the EMS. So, Jesse, let's move into the social realm because we really haven't delved into much of that yet. And I think it would also be you know, incredibly helpful to talk a little bit about what you saw. I know there were a lot of um, DEI uh, represents the biggest group, but um, a lot of those things got settled out. A lot of those things, again, people could show their, you know, we're meeting with shareholders and could show their homework and talk about what they're doing. And I just wondered what you see at that landscape um, what emerged as the kinds of things that managed to, to get some support moving forward, those that didn't, um, and the reasons for it. Yes, glad to talk about that. So in the social, so moving away from the E and the E and S and really focusing on, for now, the social, we saw some proposals on political contributions and lobbying. Those are almost mainstays and they get an average amount of support, but, and I don't think those topics are going away I don't think those are terribly exciting topics for most companies, but certainly if it's a, a topic that your board has been faced with or have uh, questions from investors about, that's where I think managing disclosure and otherwise creating appropriate policies could defray some of the risk of receiving a shareholder proposal. I think maybe more interesting and more polarizing are the DEI topics. Um, I think earlier, Paul, you mentioned that there were some proposals this year that were new on um, racial and civil um, equity audits. So really asking for companies to report on really how their performance in terms of employment or other practices um, aligns with the statements that they're making about um, their diversity and inclusion efforts. And support generally was not high for those proposals, but those proposals still continue to um, make their way onto some ballots. And my prediction here is that the Supreme Court case, the Harvard College Supreme Court case, will inspire additional um, engagement from shareholders on this topic, as well as additional proposals. So it just is a landscape that is ever evolving. And, you know, one thing that 
I always mention to boards when I'm speaking to them directly is that a successful shareholder component does not necessarily mean to that proponent um, success is that the proposal passes. It may be that's the definition of success, but it may very well be that the proponent's proposal made it onto your ballot. It created headlines. It created some discussion in the boardroom. Um, the, the topic has been now raised and socialized and otherwise brought to the attention of a larger group of shareholders. It may simply be success because of the attention that that topic is now receiving on the basis of this inclusion of that information in the proxy materials generally. So I think when we're talking about shareholder proposals, we often talk about them being successful or not based on the approval or the, the vote total um, by the shareholders. But there can certainly be, and I think in this area in particular, DEI, there can likely be um, some other social issues or other um, meaning that attaches to the ability to even make their way onto the company's ballot. Now, some just, of these- Jesse, onto, onto that point, right? The, the um, to, to your point about whether or not it's it's a majority that is success or not, you also see a lot of the proposals um, from year to year uh, getting increasing support. So you mentioned political spending, for instance, right? So I remember the time when, you know, political spending proposals were getting, you know, support in the teens, and then it was the 20s, and then the 30s, and then the 40s, and then they then they started passing, right? So to your point, um, success can be something that occurs over time from a, a shareholder proponent perspective. Totally agree with you on this. And, and in this environment of DEI, we've had a number of EEO1C type of uh, proposals and or just letters being logged at companies, which is uh, the nature of please disclose publicly your EEO1 data and your workforce and State Street and some other large institutional investors are expecting that um, disclosure by large companies. Well, we're seeing a moderation of, of shareholder proposals in that regard because companies are simply making the disclosures. So again, there is a, a new form of success there, right? The success in that situation is, well, we're just convincing particularly the largest companies that they should do this. They don't want to deal with the hassle of a proposal. It's it's the trend. It's where uh, expectations around disclosure are going. So you large companies simply disclose it and you make the issue and the, the tension with the shareholders go away. So we're certainly seeing that. And in terms of a takeaway here, I think uh, compensation committees, HR teams or others will want to continue to evaluate what disclosure they are making in terms of particularly EEO1 data, what any sort of policies they have about um, you know DEI look like so that there's at least some preparation in the boardroom if you are um, facing some sort of questions from shareholders that you know what your data looks like, you know how quickly you could disclose it if you would want to disclose it, and you would know how to react to such a um, you know line of questioning from your shareholders about are, are you actually acting in the way that your policies state that you will. So on all these issues, Jesse, the SEC is always in the background, if not the, yes. the foreground. And I know that the current disclosures have been critiqued by the chair of the SEC for not being anything that you can compare company to company, apples to apples. Uh, and then we've thought that along the way, once they issue um, cyber, now done, uh, now environment coming up, we hope relatively soon uh, or not, um, that they would be doing something in the hu human capital arena. They've talked about it, um, but we haven't really seen any movement there. And I'm wondering, again, to the very points you're making, lots of folks are already doing EEO1 disclosures, all that's good. But again, you read the statements from each company and it's hard to know um, what they're really doing in terms of where the trends are and where um, they, how, they, how they compare to others. I think that a very good point, the human capital management disclosure that's now in the 10K can really be drafted in any way that a company sees as appropriate for them. What are the material considerations that a company has when it comes to its you know, key talent and, and workforce? I think we are all expecting that post, to your point, um, climate change disclosure that the SEC will come forward with some more prescriptive, we keep using that word, um, disclosure obligations regarding diversity. But for now, most of the diversity disclosure in either a proxy statement and or the 10K is voluntary, and, and there are no specific um, guidelines or metrics that the SEC forces a company to follow to disclose what its true diversity profile looks like based on any particular race, ethnicity, class, et cetera. 
Thank you for that. Um, Paul, <laughs> this is, we're now going to move into a discussion of top governance proposals. And I'm smiling, almost laughing, because it's so easy um, to get um, caught up in the E and the S. Um, that we forget the tried and true is the part that's the governance part is always it's long existed um, and as chair of governance for my public company board um, I find these issues fascinating and this year is no different in terms of some of the trend lines so if you could talk about some of those top proposals that kind of they typically get stronger votes than the EMES but if you could comment on that it'd be terrific. Yeah, I mean, for better or worse, um, the the ESG, I think the G being at the end might be might be the wrong wrong order, right? Because because ultimately, if you have good if you have good G, you should it should follow that you have good a good approach to to E and S. Um, I'd say in the governance space, um, which which can get more granular and legal in nature, and Jesse may have some some additional thoughts on this, but. Um, you know, if you look at the history of shareholder proposals, right, even if you go back, you know, over the last 20 years or so, um, many of the governance related shareholder proposals were targeted at the largest public companies, right? And that is, you know, the, the, the companies um, that were most likely to be in the headlines. So if you look at where uh, on certain governance issues, if you look at the S&P 500 as a, as a group, um, many of those companies have already been through the process of being targeted and having adopted certain governance provisions um, that make those provisions, you know, not not particularly relevant to that group. Why does this matter for the board members on this call? Um, because many of the mid cap and small cap and micro cap companies um, uh, at this point are the companies that are vulnerable to some of these governance proposals, right? So, for instance, if you look at uh, annual elections for all directors, right? Uh, moving from a, you know, a proposal for declassifying the board, or you look for moving from a plurality voting standard to a majority voting standard. You know, the vast majority, 99% of the S&P 500 have those provisions, um, but uh, far less mid cap, small cap, and um, um, micro cap companies do. So those types of proposals continue to be um, uh, in in focus, um, there were a couple other proposals this year um, that were relevant uh, around bylaws uh, seeking shareholder uh, approval um, prior to sort of uh, enacting certain bylaws around advance notice. Um, so those uh, were present as well. Um, and then uh, an ever popular one about uh, requesting uh, a split uh, between the chair and the CEO uh, continued to be uh, in focus. In fact, we saw an increase in the number of those proposals. Uh, just as a data point, by the way, we we finally, if you look at all public companies, we finally crossed over the threshold where a majority of public companies in the U.S. now split the role between chair and CEO. I think we're at about 53 or 54 percent of all public companies. So the overarching general trend in that area is a slow move toward a uh, split role. Um, however, we're not seeing um, we're not seeing that happen in any drastic way. And we're not seeing we typically don't see that happening uh, while the CEO still holds the role. We're seeing that really as a function of board, of uh, CEO succession. So as you know, you as board members, uh, if you are going through a CEO succession or maybe going through a CEO succession in the near future, it might be a t uh, an ideal time to think through whether or not the board leadership structure you have in place is still the appropriate one going forward. Um, but these independent board chair proposals did increase uh, as a governance proposal in uh, proxy season 22. So thank you for that. Um, in a minute or two, a couple of minutes, we're going to move on to comp matters because um, another set of hot topics and always uh, of interest to all board members, all companies. Um, but I do want to cover two other things under this category, so the shareholder proposals broadly. Um, and one has to be universal proxy. What the heck happened there, Jesse? Because I was one of those last January, along with others, making the prediction that we would see this increase in activism. And I feel like um, because of a 
number of things. It just didn't happen this year, maybe macroeconomic and other circumstances for activists. But, um, but I also feel like individual directors and the whole point is that we need to still remain vigilant about this, that this may just not have played out yet. So that's a question I think we're all asking ourselves. Did it not play out yet? Did the use of universal proxy um, not have the impacts just because it was new this year? Or will there not be the impacts that were maybe highly anticipated when we were having these sessions last year? So universal proxy rules um, are generally those rules that would allow um, uh, activists at, an outside um, shareholder looking to nominate a director to use the company's proxy card. So there's only one proxy card. So the slate of um, the company's nominees and then a shareholder's nominees would be on the same proxy card. So those universal proxy rules, as we call them, are expected to have a significant impact on activist campaigns, resulting in you know everything people said from so many, you know everyone had to be prepared because they were going to get competing director nominees um, to you know the just a view that this was going to be a way that um, you know entire boards could be you know revamped through the need to settle with an activist to avoid this type of um, universal proxy card use. Well, I don't know that the data shows that much of anything truly happened in this space. Um, didn't demonstrate a, a significant use of the universal proxy card in 2023. Maybe there was a modest increase based on the data that's available that um, there were campaigns that resulted in settlement because that's not something we necessarily will you know know except for you know reviewing proxy statements to see where large um, activist type shareholders now have a board seat. So maybe um, to avoid the use of universal proxy cards, companies were more likely to settle and to say yes, we will agree to include one of um, you uh, activist funds or other. Um, shareholders, director nominees on our ballot, but director nominations from shareholder activists and advocacy groups like this just simply didn't come to fruition like we were expecting. So is that due to lack of resources? Is it due to lack of an understanding of how exactly that process would play out? Maybe a lack of qualified and sophisticated nominees because even if you were a shareholder activist or, or outside party who wanted to uh, nominate director, you need to have a nominee who's willing to serve in that role and to be viewed by your shareholder base generally as a, a better or at least an equal alternative to the nominees that you already were putting up as a company. So a mix of those you know, considerations are out there. I do think that this is just a trend to watch this year. And from a takeaway standpoint for the board members here, and you mentioned being vigilant, Gloria, I think it continues to reinforce the need for companies to be very clear in director biographies, in the section of the proxy statement that indicates why a particular nominee should be and is well qualified to serve on the board. You need to continue to look at those disclosures, your skills matrices, your very crisp disclosure about why Beth, Gloria, Jesse, Paul are well suited to be directors for that particular company in that particular industry at that point in the company's business trajectory, because that will be the best defense to any type of, um, you know, potential counter solicitation or counter nominee. Thank you. Um, and I'm so glad you emphasized that latter point. Um, we may have a chance to add a few more uh, aspects of how important these matrices can be. Uh, and some are working because they're really fulsome and, and tell the story and others still need work and some companies, still, some companies still aren't using them yet. So more to follow on that. But Paul, um, I do want to make sure we say something about director nominees um, because this was a year in which um, we could exhale for most of us because it actually trended up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I and mean, we do have some some uh, some data on director election results uh, as well. Uh, I mean, I think we we all know that sort of traditionally um, the the vast majority of elections. This is, by the way, the data on the, the right hand side of this um, right hand side of the slide. Uh, the vast majority of, of board elections are are routine and annual meetings are routine. Uh, we hear we hear about the, the uh, annual meetings where there's a lot of noise, but the, the vast majority are routine. I do think if I were sitting in your shoes as board members, uh, though, I would while I would exhale, uh, I would say that I would want to be 
tracking small movements or small changes in voting patterns uh, for directors. And I think that's probably the story for this proxy season. Now, um, I think that a best practice uh, is certainly from a board perspective that you should be regularly analyzing what the um, proxy voting policies are of your major shareholder and conducting engagement so that they can understand you know, changes and proactively act uh, in, in anticipation of a vote. Um, but there are some common reasons uh, that a shareholder might choose to vote against a director. Um, it might be for lack of board diversity. It might be for the perception that there's an oversight. Thing. It might be that um, the climate risk management disclosure in their estimation was poor. Uh, it might be that there was failed engagement activities. And by the way, on the engagement topic, uh, you know, while a majority of public companies say someone on their board other than their CEO engaged with shareholders over the last year, uh, there's still a number of board members that I speak with um, who are reluctant to do so. Uh, that might be a trigger to vote uh, against a, uh, a director. But I think sort of unqualified support for directors um, uh, continued to fall. So um, if you look at the percentage of those in 2023 that received over 95% support, uh, that number fell slightly. Um, but again, it's the small movements I think you have to uh, pay attention to. Um, I think when you evaluate director voting, you need to evaluate it in the context of also voting on shareholder proposals. Um, it appears to me in looking at this data that shareholders are actually now preferring to use their voice in the director vote to voice concerns over the use of their voice in the shareholder proposal. And that's really a reversal because there's a sort of decade long perception or norm that a view against a board member is really an escalation from uh, a vote for a shareholder proposal. Uh, so that could be something to watch. I think it's still early, um, but overall sort of key takeaway here, support continued to be strong, slight drop in those getting over 95%, watch the small movements, but also watch whether or not shareholders are now using the vote for or against the director as in, uh, in a different way uh, than shareholders. Thanks, Paul. Now, I'd love to move into um, the impact that directors continue to have, and of course, shareholders too, on things like say on pay um, and the new um, uh, pay versus performance disclosures. And why don't I divvy these up between you, Paul, starting with say on pay, and then Jesse, if you could comment on the brand new, what happened there? Um, was it like universal proxy, or do we have some real trends coming out of the pay versus performance disclosures? So, but say on pay, um, sure. that's of, um, a good turnout as well. Okay, I'll, I'll start. On the, board, um, on the board side, board and company side. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll, I'll start with maybe some of the data and then Jesse, you can you can talk about sort right. of uh, new SEC developments. So if we go back to the, the uh, that prior slide, uh, uh, if you look at the left hand side now, these are this is the data on uh, say on pay voting. So if you step back for a second uh, on average, say on pay, uh, the year of sort of the pandemic years, um, say on pay fell. Um, because shareholders were really seeking a stronger tie between compensation uh, and performance, um, and they really were challenging the rationale uh, uh, that uh, of one-time awards, right, uh, on the part of some companies. But there was some good news in 23, support for overall for pay packages rebounded this year. Um, S&P 500 companies had 88% 88 support, and the broader group, the Russell 3000, uh, the support was even higher uh, at 90%. And also there was a pretty significant drop in the number of uh, votes in which the support was below 50%. So through the first half of the year, uh, first six months, um, we had 66 uh, in 2002, and this year we had uh, 38 such proposals. Uh, in terms of the rationale here, um, it's kind of indicative of companies getting the message that um, the disconnect between 
pay and performance, um, and investors sort of continuing to consider uh, executive compensation on a on a case by case basis. Um, I think it also is a sign of confidence for boards that um, boards can, in fact, offer compensation needed to retain top talent as long as they're mindful of what the guardrails are that have really been established over the last decade. But there are other things that are impacting, I think, the executive compensation landscape. Um, we had uh, we have new pay for performance uh, rules. We also have new clawback rules. So maybe, Jesse, you want to talk uh, a little bit about some of those developments? Yeah, I'm glad to thank you, Jesse. So thank you. And the one other comment I wanted to make about what you were saying about um, sand pay trends that ties to director election, that if at a company you have a low sand pay vote, you are likely to see a lower uh, director vote for your compensation committee chair. And maybe that seems like an obvious connection, but for all you comp committee members and chairs out there, I think that's something that you should keep in mind that there's an opportunity for investors to express displeasure, not only through their say and pay vote, but apparently um, the trend is still also to ensure that the comp committee members know uh, the investors' feelings for that type of type of vote. So this year, there have been a number of new SEC developments regarding compensation, keeping management teams, board members, and lawyers and advisors busy. One that got a lot of attention uh, prior to the proxy season is the new pay versus performance disclosure responsibilities that companies really had thrown on them by the SEC very quickly this last year. And, and many companies didn't have much time to prepare at a high level this is a disclosure that follows a company's CDNA and the proxy statement and includes information on your named executive officers um, pay actually received as calculated very specifically by SEC rules versus the summary compensation table that includes, um, frankly, a pay that is perceived to be uh, likely to be received in the future as a result of you know, the counting value that's tied to uh, stock grants or option grants. So this new disclosure really is intended to reflect what did an individual actually receive, and then comparing that um, actually paid information versus some other uh, financial metrics at the company, including total shareholder return and total shareholder return of um, a peer group or an index. And why did I explain all that? It's because it's a different way that investors are receiving information about executive compensation. And going into the proxy season, there was at least some suspicion that that information would be used to uh, have shareholders react via SAM pay voting or votes against directors if that new preparation of data showed a different kind of trend than maybe had historically been known. Well, we didn't see much of that. <laughs> so that's the punchline, that there's been a lot of work, a lot of energy put into those disclosures, and it's a little bit of a ho-hum uh, result at this point. But let me say this, the ISS uh, class Lewis's of the world have not yet incorporated that information or that new data into their proxy voting guidelines. So when that happens, if it does, then maybe we will see you know, some new trends. I have not heard many compensation committees reevaluating or looking at compensation in a new way on the basis of this new data. But that also might become at least part of the mix of information that you on your comp committees will be thinking about. We have this new information presented in this way. I'm not suggesting at all that should drive compensation decisions, but it at least is a fact that may be presented to your compensation committee so that you can understand sort of that bigger picture of what your investors will see and what they will know. So this may be largely a compliance exercise at the end of the day, but I think the second year of disclosures perhaps will be more meaningful because there'll be something to compare it to um, year over year. And we will uh, wait. Yes. Sorry. I was going to say, we will wait to see what the proxy advisor, they usually take a little bit, there's a lag time before they start to weigh in on these types of issues. Um, so were you going to ask Paul for a comment as well? 
No, I was just going to mention, you know, a little bit like CEO pay ratio that really never went anywhere, right? It got attention in the media for a while, but it really didn't drive, at least as far as I um, have ever seen or read any compensation decisions. Paul also mentioned the clawback policies, those new clawback policies must be in place at all of your companies, NYC, NASDAQ companies by December. Um, will that result in any new disclosures? Maybe, but I don't know that ultimately we will see an impact with regard to um, those clawback rules in the next proxy season. Maybe we will though in the future to the extent companies do need to apply them and then disclose what they've clawed back. And then following up from that, perhaps consider what their um, incentive compensation packages look like uh, as a result of a concern or an actual clawback that may occur. And so really I have not heard uh, many compensation consultants or advisors or otherwise talking to comp committees and saying, you should revisit how you create your compensation packages to make less of your compensation incentive base so that it can not be clawed back. Um, that's just not been a line of conversation yet, but I think that's another area where you know we'll have to see how this develops. Thanks for all those really useful comments. I'm gonna do something a little different now, which is ask you to do sort of a lightning round around mm -hmm. some issues that uh, come up that are related to general governance and the kinds of things that are disclosed in proxies. So very helpful to sort of have your comments. And Jesse, you already did comment a bit on the director's skills and qualifications and how these matrices can be incredibly useful. So perhaps you could comment on overboarding for just a minute or two. And then Paul, I'll ask you to make a couple of comments too about things like that, as well as investor. I certainly would love to hear a little bit more about investor engagement, um, but I wanna make sure that we do it within the limits of our clock. Quickly on overboarding, the proxy advisory firms, all the large shareholders and maybe medium-sized shareholders now have expressed views on what they think is the appropriate number of boards each of you should be sitting on to ensure that you're able to maximize your time and attention to various boards. You should know as a board, the management team can pull this for you exactly what the policies are at those investors where you really do care about their reaction and, and know ISS and Glass-Lewis policies. If a company does not have its own overboarding policy, it really should be thinking about putting one in place. State Street and some other larger investors are expecting that you have your own policy and that you disclose it and that you disclose how you're monitoring it. We are seeing that there is an ability for companies to disclose around overboarding, meaning that if you, and BlackRock actually included this in its end of season report, if a company has what is deemed to be an overboarded director by some investors policy, but does an excellent job of explaining why in fact that director has enough time to commit to that board and how the company is monitoring that and, and what sort of checks and balances are in place, then BlackRock has said it won't vote against that director. So this goes back to disclosure, 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 and ensuring you're thinking about this well in advance of the preparation of the proxy statement. Thanks. The only quick thing I'd add is that um, from our own experience at my company uh, is that um, you can have really strict rules on overboarding and still run against and they may match those of the proxy advisory groups but um, SSGA has its own and we had one director who ran up against that and lost you know a percentage of votes um, as but was still meeting our standards so sort of an interesting point which you which you were mentioning when you referred to State Street so but, but, Gloria, I do I do think on this on the overboarding issue directors do have to ask themselves some difficult questions on this one, right? The last NAC date, NACD data I saw showed, you know, if you look at the time commitment that directors spend in their role, it's, it, it, it's you know, the trajectory is up. It's close to 300 hours, I think, in the NACD report um, per board. Um, and so, you know, really asking with the expanding mandate uh, and expectations of directors, you know, do, do I have the appropriate amount of time to be able to spend on all of my board responsibilities? Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. And sometimes those questions are important to ask, even when you've set yep. specific standards. Because our standards, for example, also include the number of audit chairs that you can occupy, um, chairs of boards, in addition to a sheer number of companies that could be even less if you hold these leadership roles in different companies. So thanks. Now, just really quickly before we get to the conclusion, um, I do want you to say something. Both of you to say something about investor engagement because. 
I just think that's such an incredibly important aspect as you think about moving into the proxy season. And it's really that timing of meeting with shareholders is now, starting now. So it would be useful to hear your thoughts. I can kick that yeah. off, Paul, and give a yeah. couple sentences and turn it to you. So uh, I think we should all expect that directors will need to participate more in shareholder engagement meetings, that investors are asking for more nuanced information. They're asking to understand the role of each director, the full board committee's oversight in various specific areas, including climate and cyber and a number of the environmental and, and social issues that we just talked about. And board participation certainly helps to demonstrate oversight. Companies, I think, should be putting in place pretty clear practices and procedures if they don't have them already about how directors engage and participate, what members of management are on those calls. And typically I'd recommend that there is always a member of management on that call. Oftentimes best to be the corporate secretary or the lawyer to ensure that you know, you're thinking through all the legal aspects of in Reg FD and selective disclosure, but generally uh, putting a process in place to ensure that director participation is, is there's an opportunity for it, but that it's not putting directors in an awkward position where they're expected to answer some questions that are really much more management type questions and, and veer from the oversight. Just continue to draw that line between the role of a director and the role of management, managing versus oversight. Well, it can be so impactful. It can be so yeah. impactful if done well. So, Paul, instead, because our time is, is so tight, I would love it if each of you could just give literally lightning style one or two takeaways, um, because this was just such a rich, uh, rich well of information this morning. Um, what do you want people to most take away from this? Um, uh, I think I think one of the one of the most important things comes back to the topic Jesse was just talking about, and that's engagement. Um, and I think that uh, b besides having parameters around the sort of who, what, when, where, why process element of it, I think that there are implications of board composition. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, I've worked with lots and lots of boards where the lead director or the chair of the compensation committee or the chair of NomGov was a fantastic director, but one of their core skill sets was an engagement. Um, and so my, my one of my takeaways is as you're thinking about your succession planning um, and as engagement becomes uh, increasingly something that boards do and an expectation of boards and part of sort of the, the scope of being a board member, uh, think about whether or not you have a camera ready director, right, uh, for, for those engagements. Um, and if you don't, that should be, as you think through your board matrices and in the same way you think about, you know, financial uh, expertise and industry expertise and diversity, right? I think the ability to engage is critical. So I, I would I would, um, uh, I would, focus on that. And then uh, one final takeaway is just on, you know, with all the new disclosure that we're expecting and we're thinking about uh, how to prepare for, I think this also has implications uh, for board composition. So as board members, you know, in light of the new cyber disclosures and the climate disclosures, you're, you're going to need to think about how you address these issues from a composition standpoint. And you can do it by adding directors, although that might not be the right solution. You could think, you, think about it from the perspective of using an outside expert, right, to supplement the board's knowledge. Uh, or you could think about it from the perspective of how are we going to upskill as a board and do education uh, to get us up to speed to understand what the right questions to be asking the management team are. So I'd say engagement uh, on one and figure out how the board is going to address the composition challenges that the new disclosure requirements are going to be. Jesse, before we turn it over to our lead, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, Last I have two quick questions that you, I think, as directors maybe could ask in addition to what Paul was saying. One, how is your company effectively communicating to investors the value of each individual director, what values each of your directors bring to the board. Think about that because a lot of what we talked about depends on you know how your investors are viewing individual directors and their value, first question. And then the second question, how is your board staying informed on the key issues, interests of your largest shareholders? Do you have that information? And if you don't, how are you gonna get it to better prepare you for this next proxy season to come? Well, thank you too. Both no, thank you. It was just fabulous presentation. More to follow, slides to come to everyone. Um, and let's turn it back over now to the NACD folks in Philadelphia. Thank you.
Well, uh, all I have to say is I've taken oodles of notes. Um, I think all of us on the call have, and uh, a huge thank you to Paul, Jesse, and Gloria for giving us the most actionable um, webinar that I think many of us have been on in a very long time. I It's always wonderful to get the information, but what to do with it and put it into practice, you gave us plenty of points in order for us to uh, to do so. So thank you so very much for your information, your guidance, and, and most importantly, the time, the generosity of time that you put into this program. And I want to really thank the New England, our New England partners. Um, we are very fortunate in Philadelphia to have you as our partners for these programs. And just so everyone on the call uh, puts down in your in your um, calendar that we again, as a as a collective unit, will sponsor a program on January sixteenth. Uh, between New England and Philadelphia, and it will be the hot topics for proxy season uh, for the current proxy season. So um, get ready. We're going to keep it rolling and, and bring you lots of additional information on that topic. So um, a couple of quick announcements. You know, we first of all, we have the NACD Summit, which is coming forward, an annual event where most of uh, the, the influential minds in this space congregate. It will be between October 8th and the 11th um, in the Washington, D.C. area. I know that New, Jer New, New England as well as Philadelphia have plans for our chapters, so please uh, reach out, make sure that you're familiar with that. And most importantly, it's with incredible value uh, to each one of us to be in person and to see each other. Um, so please register today. It will only take you a couple of minutes and let us know if we can be helpful. Um, also, we have upcoming programs on both sides. Please make sure that you guys are looking at that because our fall is packed. I mean, I could say it for both of us. Uh, we are packed with, with opportunities for you to be involved. And then finally, there is a survey that will be posted um, and it will be, uh, your, your feedback obviously is very, very important and it will be a link that's in the chat. So feel free in order to do that. Um, I also saw a number of chat comments and we really appreciate those comments. And while we weren't able to weave a lot of the questions in, I hope that we've answered them because I saw a lot of comments as opposed to uh, questions. So I know that Paul, Jesse and Gloria touched on so many topics. Uh, that once you get off this call, you need to digest. But most importantly, this is recorded. So you will have the opportunity to go back, as I will probably two or three times, to, to um, watch this rich program. So thank you all for attending. We so appreciate your time. And again, we look forward to seeing you at the next programs in New England, as well as Philadelphia. Thank you all very much and have a great day.